true sign of intelligence is not knowledge but imagination albert einstein hello and welcome to the bioprinting session powered by altim hosted by biotechnica i'm your host shekhar and today is the sixth session where we come to you live to discuss one of the most unique topic of today which is high resolution bioprinting with hydrogel photo inks today's session is nothing but imagination once upon a time all this was just imagination but somebody made it reality and that's what amazes me that's what is something which you should take away apart from of course the all the knowledge which our speakers are going to give today and that is imagination is the true power of researcher if you want to become a great researcher like edison like einstein then then you have to be imaginative and today's session we are going to talk about one such future concept which is becoming a re reality today and that is using hydrogel photo inks to reproduce high resolution bioprinting so people this is going to be a power backed session and i invite you to attend this session today is the uh, the sixth session to the last session of uh, alt empowered webinar on bioprinting and uh, we have requested for one additional session probably uh, for the q and a but uh, if uh, we we are not yet not yet confirmed on that so ideally this is going to be the sixth session and after that we'll be releasing the e certificates to all those who have attended all the six sessions now to start with if i have to you know recall when we started the first session of uh bioprinting in may late may i i saw the enthusiasm in most of you and uh, what amazes we amazes me what makes me happy today is i still see that enthusiasm in all of you that enthusiasm to learn and that enthusiasm to become a great researcher so i'm sure all of you have already shared this video link this webinar link with all your friends and colleagues have you done have you done that yes okay wonderful so today's session is going to be super special because we have our speaker with a lot of experience in that in experience in this topic and this alt empowered six power packed sessions which we conducted and today is the sixth session i want to remind you that throughout the internet and throughout the globe this is the most valuable insight you could get from an industry expert right inside bioprinting so this is really really exclusive information which you got in the last five sessions and of course in today's session and uh, the videos are always going to be there on biotechnica's youtube channel please do refer them share with your friends and colleagues and of course whenever you are doing some kind of research where you want to implement uh bioprinting uh, technology then you know where to whom to approach you know altems website right you have to go there and talk to them they are the experts in bioprinting 3d bioprinting so now uh before i pass on the controls to our speaker of the day i have only one request for all of you please attend this session till the end because we are going to distribute the e certificates based on this session also once you have filled all the forms at the end then only you are getting going to get the e certificates apart from that please make sure that you are entering your correct email id and phone number so that if in case uh, altem wants to contact you or you want to contact altem you will be in touch with them also there is a contest going on on linkedin profile of altem please go ahead and uh, participate in that i saw a lot of you participating right so please do that and they are going to give away the amazing vouchers to the winners and yes like we have promised we are going to give the five most active participants of throughout the six sessions biotechnica t-shirts okay so without taking much of your time it's time to invite our speakers over to you
Uh, hi everyone. Uh, good evening again, and thank you for joining me on this session, which is the sixth session of our series. And the topic is high resolution printing with hydrogel photo inks. Uh, I am Aishwarya Shirur, and I'm a technical specialist at Altum Technologies. So while we proceed with the rest of our session or the main uh, crux of this session, I'll just go back to telling you about all of the applications, just as a reminder. And from there, we'll be able to um, exactly understand the use of what high resolution printing or high resolution bioprinting is. So um, we started with an introduction to 3D bioprinting, followed by what is the application in tissue engineering, soft robotics and organ on a chip was one of the areas. Then we worked into uh, drug discovery, drug delivery. And uh, now we are coming into this entire section, which is high resolution. So um, this image that you see to your right is actually an image of a vascular lung structure. And in fact, this is a perfusible, rather a breathable lung. And this create quite a lot of tension or quite a lot of fascination in the field of tissue engineering itself, understanding that this was vascular. What you see red around this is actually the flow of um, blood or rather an imitation of blood. And you would see that there was there is a amount of air which flows into that sac, which makes it bulge up and then it expand, basically expand and contract. So um, the idea of printing this is what we're going to talk about. And um, I hope this makes things clear for you as I proceed with the session. And um, as usual, I'm going to begin with talking about us. And uh, so we are Altum Technologies. We're a 3D innovation platform company. And um, we work with several, several industries and we work with several products, um, starting with the Sol Systems for CATIA, MSC software for uh, you know computational fluid dynamics or any sort of other simulations. Um, we have statuses for plastic printing. Um, you know both F, uh, all three FDM, Polyjet, SLA prints. Then we have Artec 3D for the 3D scanners. Then we have uh, Dassault Systems again for BioVia. This is for in silico modeling or life science simulations. And then we come to Selic, which is 3D bioprinting. Um, and it's been a couple of years where we started from 2011 and now we are still growing and we are still, um, you know, um, adding on the list of people to our um, customers and partners. And um, while our customers are in the area of education and research, aero defense, automotive, healthcare, IT solutions, customer products, and it keeps growing, right? So life science and healthcare and every other industries where we are um, always working and still, still, you know, uh, helping out with. So um, while we come to the main part, I will again uh, give you a brief about what 3D bioprinting is for the people who did not join the previous sessions and give you a quick recap. Um, 3D bioprinting is a form of additive manufacturing. Like we all know where you use cells, you use biocompatible materials, which are called bio inks. And then this actually creates your model layer by layer in order to mimic the behavior of natural living systems. So um, 3D printing, 3D bioprinting is actually derived from the idea of tissue engineering along with 3D printing. And the main components here are cells, bio inks, and the culture media. So I'll play this video for you. So this gives you a quick recap. 3D bioprinting by Abir Sinal with the new and lab at UNC Chapel Hill. We print things all the time. Whether they're documents, posters, or flyers, printing is an important technology in our daily lives. Relatively recently, however, printing took a big step forward with 3D printing. We could build a 3D model on the computer, send it to the printer, and we could have that object in our hands in hardly any time. What if I told you that this isn't the limit? There is more to explore. What if we could print living things made up of cells. We could make blood vessels, tissues, and organs. We could help the hundreds of thousands of people waiting on transplant lists. 
This idea is not too far from reality if we use 3D bioprinting. 3D bioprinting is just like normal 3D printing, except it uses living cells as ink to create living structures. Like 3D printing, you have to create a model on a computer, then layer by layer, your living structure will be printed. The first step in the process is known as pre-bioprinting. Here, the desired product is determined and studied. Oftentimes, 3D scans, such as CT scans or MRI images, are taken of the desired product and are then converted into a series of 2D images to serve as a template for the different layers. Cells are then isolated and extracted from an organism, which is often the recipient of the product, in order to create bioink. Bioink is one of the most important parts of the 3D bioprinting process. It starts with the cells that were extracted. Then, molecules called hydrogels are added to provide water for the cells. Other nutrients and chemicals are added so that the cells can grow and communicate as if they were in a living body. Once the BioLink is developed, we reach the step of doing the actual printing. Using the BioLink, our organ is printed layer by layer until we achieve our final product. There's not just one method of bioprinting. Different types include inkjet printing, acoustic printing, and laser printing. The most common type of bioprinting, however, is extrusion printing. This method is probably how you would normally think of 3D printing. The bioink is loaded into a printing chamber and is pushed out around nozzle. The nozzle produces a tiny filament that is often around 400 microns in diameter or about the thickness of four pieces of paper. Once you finish the physical bioprinting portion, the final step is solidification. In general, bioink is a viscous liquid, so in order for it to become the desired product, it needs to harden. Sometimes, the bioink will solidify on its own. Other times, the process of cross-linking will occur with the aid of things like exposure to UV light, physical changes like heating or cooling, or chemical changes due to the addition of certain compounds. So this gave us a quick recap. And uh, now we'll come down to the types of bioprinters. So we, I have already mentioned this in prior, but this will give you some perspective with what direction we're reading into. Uh, we have looked into inkjet bioprinting, laser-assisted extrusion and stereolithography. Um, over the last couple of sessions, we have continuously spoken about extrusion printing with our set of uh, bioprinters. And we know that extrusion printing is basically using either mechanical or pressure uh, or indirect pressure to uh, extrude a filament, right? Now, similarly, when you talk about a difference in technology, we come into a, a section which is stereolithography. So stereolithography is actually a light assistant method. And this light is what is going to drive the formation of the layers which you want to create. So I'll explain as we go. Stereolithography is a photopolymerization based method. So photopolymerization means the chain of the polymers will come together or interact together or cross link when there is light applied, right? So this is a rapid prototyping technique. And here you have computer data, which is the CAD models, which are used. And this will spatially control the radiation of liquid resin. So when you talk about SLA, you have a vat, uh, basically a plate consisting of a resin of your choice. And to that resin, you will have the laser which falls on, onto it. So as this laser falls over this ink, with each time, the resin actually cures. Basically, it solidifies. So in this process where you're talking about polymerization or rather curing, 
the ink which is uh, ink or the hydrogel or the resin which is probably in the liquid form the fluidic form is going to convert into semi solid or rather solid so this is the idea behind sla printing now why sla printing is considered better how are we progressing towards it is because it actually enables structures with precision so you can develop or create structures in the micro de micro uh, scales and this is for better resolution and for better structures so here i'm giving you an example of an sla print this is a general sla print but when you look at the complexity of the image you will understand that for it to stay mechanically stable and to create those mesh like structures in the middle is quite an effort because we need to have the stability we need the shape fidelity and we need other factors to also play in when you creating this so this is an example of a general printed plastic sla uh, structure now when we go to something which is more relevant to bioprinting since the session is on bioprinting i will talk about dlp printing so dlp printing is considered to be a sister technology to sla it's called digital light processing right so here the light is going to be processing the resin material so um here obviously it is going to be light assisted it is filament independent it is of high resolution and it creates watertight models and there are maybe limited set of materials which are available so when you talk about dlp versus sla it's actually million pixels of light which are falling on the resin bed instead of just one focused laser beam right so that's the difference that's why this is also considered a little more accurate because you have many pixels creating precision in the design that you create so um we know that there is a liquid resin which we are using and the liquid resin stays within a vat you have a built platform and then you have the light source which is going to help in it so i'll tell you about the working principle now so when you talk about dlp printing we said we are going to be using light so here we have 405 nanometers of industrial projectors so the light or the the intensity or resolution of the light is going to be 1280 by 800 pixels right so this is now projected onto um onto these dmds which are micro mirrors which are within a encapsulated set this reflects the light takes it to the top which is the pdms lined vat there is maybe droplet of the resin that you have then simultaneously as the build platform moves it goes on printing right so this goes on projecting a series of images in order to create that layer that structure that you want and when you go to the steps it goes from design 3d models which we generally go with maybe cad models then we go through a process of slicing that cad model basically you have something complex you try to simplify it and then create the same structure again right so this layer which is or the set of layers that are sliced right they start to stack up together to form your entire uh, entire object or the entire model that you want to create so this projected pattern light as you see here in the bottom you see this blue light which is falling this projected light keeps on changing each time it keeps blinking there is on there is off there is a movement of the build platform as the structure is being formed and eventually you will have a printed structure right so this printed structure will definitely be more watertight it will have less amount of spaces between it you can obviously modulate the porosity based on other set of studies so i show you this more in detail so that whatever i explained makes more sense you see that this build platform keeps on moving up and down and simultaneously in the bottom the light is projecting also one second yeah the process is photo photopolymerization that happens right and you will notice that in this vat the material or the resin which is placed is not in a fluid structure it's not flowing about or it's not in the entire surface 
So the reason being you have something called as a PDMS VAT. The idea behind using a PDMS VAT is actually to first um, allow the allow the transmission of light through that resin bed that you have. Another reason being we need to take care of the surface tension. As the print bed keeps or the build platform keeps moving, you'll notice that the fluid will also keep moving. So it, it makes it hard for all of the all of the material to stably create the structure you want. And having taken care of your um, uh, surface tension, you can easily be able to get the surface area between the build platform and the resin bed equally. So when you use a photo ink, right, a hydrogel, we know hydrogels are liquid um, liquids or uh, semi-solid materials which have a specific gelation property. They can retain a lot of water. They have something called a swelling factor. They are good in terms of nutrition. It allows good amount of uh, nutrition for the cells to thrive in. And while they are just hydrogels, they lack the capability of just directly photopolymerizing. They don't just photopolymerize unless you add something to it, right? So you have to make a material smarter and better for it to function in, a, in the way you want it to be. So in this process, while we are creating the hydrogels, we are going to use photo initiators, cross-linkers, basically the cross-linking agent, and then you have the material itself. And following that, right, when you have optimized a material or when you have used a material, you need to take care of, say, the exposure time, the intensity of the light that it is printing in. I cannot let the light intensity be too high when I'm using cells because this can damage the cells, right? Exposure time, again, should be adequate. I cannot make it as less than one second or less than the standard number of time it will take to cure. Next is obviously the wavelength of the light. Like I mentioned, it's 405 nanometers. So we keep all of these factors in mind while we are creating a hydrogen in order for it to create the structure and in order to retain the mechanical stability. So with the inks, right, with hydrogel inks, with the photo inks, uh, we have optimized um, there are a few which are in making. There is a lot of process happening, a lot of optimization happening where they have uh, come down to materials like PEGDA, polyethyl glycol diacrylate, right? That is one. And then you have gelma, which is gel gelatin methacrylate. These are photo inks, not in their original forms, but in the optimized and the customized forms. They are customized, like I said, to the previous notes, right? So when you're talking about the PEGDA, we have a series of materials that are available in them and they have been modulated in the factor of it being able to um, it, it being able to adjust to different struts. Say example, you have a scaffold and you need a strut of say so much micrometers or you want the distance to be so much, you want uh, you know the pressure to be so much, so you need to optimize it. So that way we have PEGDA, PEGDA start, PEGDA 500, PEGDA 200. So these are all of different stiffnesses. And obviously they're biocompatible, except PEGDA material is not a biodegradable material as such so easily. It is biocompatible, but not very easily biodegradable. And it is it has a very different degradation time because this is a material that is not naturally synthesized. It is a it is an artificially synthesized material, right? And then you have gelma. So gelma is rather a, um, a natural form of gelatin and this is supposed to help or allow in better cell growth. And that's why we tend to use um, gelma as a photo ink in order to print with cells. So you see in this image that you can easily put the cells, mix the cells along with the photo ink on the print bed resin and you can print it with the cells. Yes you will have a difference in the viability of the cells, the life, basically the live dead assays of the cells and the contamination factors to take care of, right? Uh, these are some things you can control for sure. And uh, there is also another factor. You will, you will wonder that, okay, I have a photo ink, maybe of room temperature, and I have my cells, which are supposed to be alive at 37 degrees, right? 
So the print bed or where the projection happens also has a feature of taking care of the temperature. So it can heat it up to a point where it can come up to 37 degrees. So the idea is to make it a very comfortable environment for the cells to grow in while they are going through this process of photopolymerization. So the applications are going to align with the applications we have dealt with with time for you to understand how better or how differently we can create these models. So you have 3D cell culture. We have talked about how 3D models are more in demand or more efficient in terms of representing humans, representing animals. And then we have the biomaterial development. So this is a very growing area because we have so many materials naturally available that can be easily optimized. I wouldn't say easily, but can be optimized to an extent that they can allow creating your so-called artificial organs. Then comes organ on a chip or microfluidic devices. We have also spoken about microfluidic models and organ on a chips where um, you create a easy testing platform or you create a platform in order to allow a better study of microfluidics itself. Then comes co complex tissue models. So while we use extrusion printing, we can create, you know, tissue models and they can be complex. But in case you're looking at creating something a little more intricate, right? You need something of high resolution. That's when DLP bioprinting will come in. So I'll talk about a couple of cases which are in favor of how DLP printing is. So um, if you know about organogenesis, right? Organogenesis is the process of how the organs are formed in our body. And in this process of forming or growing, right? A person growing, an embryo growing into a fetus, you will know that the heart is the first one to grow or the heart is the first organ to form. So here, this study is actually for us to understand the development of the heart, right? And this is to understand the cells and the dynamic microenvironments that you would be using. So in this study, they have looked at an embryo heart as well as a fetal heart. So in an embryo heart, they have seen at day 22 and a fetal heart at day 33, right? Week 33. So when you're looking at these, um, you will see that definitely through these images, they are more developed when you compare them. So the kind of techniques we would use, we would definitely go for imaging. We would go for either ultrasound or we will, we will go for MRI. So the MRI, which is taken is a 4D MRI, which is us considering time also and picture. Time and space are two things we always try to match and try to study and understand. So using these images, right, using these slices, we convert our 2D slices into 3D slices and forming a CAD model, right? And now we already know what form of bioprinter we're using. This is a DLP-based bioprinter. So the investigation that you do over here is actually going to be one, the use of bioprinting itself and also the perfusion. How is there going to be a flow? We need to check the hemodynamics. We, going, we, need, we need to see the flow study. We need to also understand the impact. And also we need to know how factors like space, how factors like flow rate can impact the development of a heart, right? So end of the day, we will be using cells here and we will try to understand that how is the developmental process happening and if we understand this, or if we are even close to understanding this, maybe this will give us a good understanding of certain diseases. How could we diagnose diseases or how can we avoid diseases? So these are the um, main research work that is happening. And here is where <clears throat> we start with this. So when you see with the embryonic heart, you will go with um, maybe a simple tube, right? Uh, the, the tube formation is the starting process of organogenesis. And then comes the rest of the parts where you have the ventricles forming. And now we are studying the left ventricle as well as the, um, uh, the, um, the tube, basically the heart tube, right? 
so once the printing is done here in this printing we have used gelma right gelma ink so we have eventually seeded with cells um point being first we need to analyze what is the flow how is it affecting the structure that we have created we have created a model but we cannot just directly use cells into it because we need to know and understand what is the impact of a liquid flowing within that structure because it goes through a lot of shear stress in order to flow through every part right so once you have your cells been seeded we are using endothelial cells so endothelial cells are the um, basic unit of the tubes are blood vessels right this is the whole laminal structure and the nature of huvcs which is endothelial cells is that they have a habit of stacking up line by line right few cells have have a nature of um forming a flat surface sticking to a flat area like fibroblast some of them are circular some of them have a nature of binding to the uh, sides of a wall right so um they do the study here and later on after they have done this cell seeding they have been able to understand through perfusion studies that which part is getting developed more or which part is affected more where do you see a better cell viability and also what is the flow dynamics within the heart so there are two things here right you have an interplay where you're seeing the cell cell interaction you're looking at the cell and ecm interaction also you're looking at the spatial factors you're looking at the flow factors impacting the heart so this study consists of two major giveaways uh, also understanding us or making it so easy for us to create models of heart um, while it was something that we couldn't have imagined long ago so while this has happened they go through analysis and they understand that okay in certain regions the perfusion is less so the cell viability could be less and this kind of leads to creating better study outcomes and for us to understand you know the growth or the progression of the left ventricle and how it can how it could progress right now if i know if one particular section is not functioning properly then maybe okay the blood flow is a problem or maybe this is a particular section we need to deal with right these are just scenarios that are, it's quite complex um, so this just helps me tell you that you can use um in you know uh, creating such complex heart models very easily so this is thanks to imaging you have uh, you have computational modeling which is for example softwares like msc you have imaging techniques and then again you have bioprinting so it's an amalgamation of quite a lot of technologies being put together to actually create these research outcomes so this is another one and this is a slightly complex case um this is creating a thermofluidic um pattern or a thermofluidic chamber for gene patterning here they are trying to study the heat exchangers for actuation of transcription so this is more related to genetics and also trying to see what impact cells would have right they want to see how hypothermia hypo or hyperthermia can impact the effect of genetic regulation of the cells right this is the whole study and here we started with using or creating a single fluidic channel and they started to see the impact right a flow which is happening uh, through conventional convention and transduction methods so the temperature is also something which is monitored and seen over time and over that you have flow analysis that is happening so initially as usual it is going to start with without cells then you go with with cells then you want to analyze as the temperature increases what is the impact right or uh, what is the impact on uh, the irradiation what is the impact on uh, the the genetic expression so uh, this progresses over trying it in 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 vivo over a rat model where they now try to go with complex fluidic structures so instead of one line maybe it's it's a cross right or maybe it's a little more complex so with each complexity they were able to understand because why the complexity is, is created in the first place right why are we testing it with complex models is because that's how our blood flow our veins our nerves are right they are um they are not in a specific pattern 
they they're very irregular and there is quite some uh, fluidic flow and we need to analyze that <clears throat> so while i told you of two cases the potential is very high in dlp bioprinting uh, no doubt extrusion printing is is an amazing technique it's also a technique which is widely used and it's more easier to use um, dlp printing on on another on another hand is a is more of a a uh, complementary technology to extrusion printing itself so uh, the potential of dlp printing is one the biomaterial development so you can create so many natural polymers you can um, really mix and match and see that you can use biocompatible materials more mechanically strong materials and as these materials are developed you will eventually use them in creating models in creating uh maybe tissue models disease models etc so uh while dlp is a technique which can work with or without cells um it creates a better medical device manufacturing right because uh you will be combining tough materials maybe along with natural materials understanding whether this is the most biocompatible form because the main um main thing about medical devices is that they have to be biocompatible right so having a printer which easily can take care of the exposure times taking care of the light intensities while you're optimizing the material will help you create maybe functionalized devices or implants so anatomy models like the the previous case we saw with the heart we could easily create such a delicate structure maybe in a smaller scale but enough for us to understand the disease you can create create disease progression models you can have pre surgical models as well so pre surgical models are basically when there is a complicated case complicated case and a surgeon needs to take care of the surgery and before taking a surgery the best way is to understand the body of that person so we are all unique creatures while we are all humans we are all quite unique with our structures our anatomies are different and so there is a need to incorporate imaging techniques and also 3d printing techniques so you can use this pre surgical modeling for either by using bio printers or normal plastic printers for you to understand what is the right way to access a particular point of surgery say example as a tumor say example as something you need to uh remove there's an extraction process that needs to happen so you can plan it easily so that this what this actually does right this planning can one thing reduce the amount of comorbidity you will you will not have to suture through multiple places to get to that site so there's there is something called cutting guides where we use then we have um another area where you can save that is time and obviously you will save money so these are some very interesting uh applications where you can potentially use dlp bioprinting then you have in vivo implants right so biodegradable uh, materials using natural uh, hydrogels or maybe resins um you will be able to create very simple structures so if you talk about a nerve conduit with channels right you can easily create channels while you can create a tube i know it sounds just like a tube but creating a tube is a lot of work you need to understand that when you are stacking a structure in the z axis you need to say that till a certain point there has to remain a stability of the structure while you also make sure that it is photocured right mechanical stability as well as the complexity of the structure and why i'm creating the structures quite important then you can obviously create uh, customized materials customized mo uh, models for example here they've used um customized zirconia implants um this is one of one of the potential places and um here i'm just showing you some examples say there they've tried try to create maybe a hard bone a soft muscle structure so you can easily create this sort of structure then you have um maybe the dental area the dental uh, implants surgical guides maybe any other form of your head or any other part of your body right then you have filling materials so hydrogels like i told you are biocompatible they are good in aiding 
treatment in wound healing and other um, forms so you can use this as a filling material and now the question is okay why can't i just put the filling material directly no the the uh, the incision that is made is different the size of the incision is also going to matter if i can create something like a graft which is of customized nature for a patient then i will um, be able to efficiently create these or set the results for that then you have drug delivery systems and drug discovery so drug delivery systems would be maybe a micro needle like i mentioned in the previous session you can easily create the um, you know the incision points or how these needles uh, points are with dlp printing you have drug discovery that is again through organ on a chip maybe 3d cell mod models or tissue engineering models all of these are uh, made quicker and then you have microfluidic study so there is a lot of microfluidic studies a lot of analysis that is being done and you need quick forms or quick easily um, perfusible forms of uh, channels that you can create to to carry out the study so if you see this model here it's a complex loop which is a circle and around it is is a continuous loop so creating a structure like that can also be easily done when you use dlp based printing so again i'm going to play this demonstration video which will give you a proper flow of everything so here you start with the cal calibration process so every machine needs a calibration so we go through a calibration just to make sure that the build platform is intact with the resin bed this is to improve the surface contact right then you see there is a exposure time light intensity that you can adapt and adjust based on material here they put the ink so with this ink you're actually you don't have to entirely pour in the material that you want the machine itself is going to tell you okay for a 3d slice or a structure of this dimension this is the amount of photo ink you will require so you can conveniently use that to avoid any sort of wastage so this moves as the light is passing through it and it as, as it passes through it would create a model like this so that's with the luminex which is a dlp based printer and um, you know about our other solutions which is incredible plus biox biox6 uh, bio mdx um, telling about bio mdx it's actually a industrial grade a machine with multiple set of print heads liquid handling uh, high throughput screening and other functions and then we have luminex so um, in our life sciences solutions we also have biovia which is a, a biological modeling simulation suite and it has the biovia discovery studio and uh, this completely works with bioinformatics and chemi informatics solutions so here you can just short line the time uh to discover a drug or um go through that process of creating a pharmaceutical product so um this is a quiz question and uh, the question is which technology is digital light processing related to filament extrusion sla inkjet saf so you can scan this to visit our altum page or you can simultaneously visit altum technologies on linkedin or other platforms where you can answer this question also a reminder the person who will, who will win this is going to be someone who has correctly answered all of the previous questions including this so um thank you so much thank you for um sitting through the session and thank you for uh, attending all the previous sessions for who who attended it and uh, kindly subscribe share follow us um, as much as possible and um, please pass this word because um, since we are not only a life science solution platform we provide you solutions with everything and anything possible so you can easily contact us yeah thank you this is the end of the session all right so how was the session guys did you like it yes wonderful i'm sure you all enjoyed this 
knowledge full session this empowering session this enriching session and now that we have come to the end of our power packed series of bio printing now is the time to give you the goodies and the e certificates so we are giving the link in the description in the chat box right now please fill the form please fill it very very carefully make sure that the email id is correct and followed with that in the next 7 working days you're going to get your e certificate okay it will be emailed to you if in case you don't get it please contact us okay you know how to contact us you can email us at info@biotechnica.org at and uh, in the meanwhile um the experts of eltem will confirm us on the q and a session if we can have a special q and a session so uh, so that we can have that session also and where you can ask your questions and all your doubts and queries can be answered right so with this we come to an end of our six sessions you know guys um all good things come to an end but i believe this is not the end this is the beginning of your excellent research career in bioprinting i believe this is the beginning of your uh odyssey your journey where you can utilize this excellent tool in your research and uh, the self now see you in our next webinar thank you so much for watching bye bye take care